Welcome back. This is Ryan Adams. We're going to jump into the third section of our build for our lab environment. At this point, we've built the operating system, configured everything in Hyper-V. We've gotten our Active Directory and our networking and routing and our cluster and everything's all configured. So now we're just down to creating the actual availability group. And the first thing we need to make sure of that we do here is make sure that we've got permissions right in Active Directory. So I'm actually going to look at our domain controller here. Now you'll notice that we've got our three nodes and I've also got one representing the cluster. This is the CNO object. Now when we go in and we create an availability group, when we create the listener, it also creates a computer object here in Active Directory. What we need to make sure of is that those permissions are here to be able to do that. The account that's used to do that is actually the cluster object account itself, so it's this CNO cluster one. So what we can do is we can uh, right click and do properties here on the computer's OU. This is the, the first of two methods. The other method I won't do, but I'll just explain what that is when we get there. Um, I've actually already done it, but all we really needed to do is click add here. You're going to have to go into object types because it's a computer object and that's not selected by default. So we need to make sure we go in and check off this computers right here. We'll click OK. We'll type in cluster one dollar sign since it's a computer object. Check names and it does find it. So we'll click OK here. And then we've got cluster one. Now for us here in our demo environment, the easiest thing to do is just to select allow full control, which is what I've done here. If you want, you don't have to do that. It really only needs to be able to read all properties and create computer objects. You could have been more granular, gone into advanced, and then done add and given it those two permissions, which would have been uh, the read all properties permission here. And then down here, when you scroll down, we're going to see the create computer objects right here. So we could have just done that. This is just a lab environment, so it's just easy or to go ahead and do the full control. So that's what I've done here. So now that those rights are here, the computer object will get created. And we'll leave that up in the background so we can kind of see that object as it happens. So now we need to create the availability group. One of the first things we need to do here is this is a brand new lab environment. So we need to create some databases. Now I've actually already done that because you can see over here on the left that I've already got my three databases up and running. So those pieces are already there and ready to go. But what I want to do is give you the code so that you're able to actually do that yourself. So this just goes in, drops the database if it exists, creates the new database, uh, app1 ag underscore db1, db2, and db3. And that's all we do there. And then, of course, one of the prerequisites for an availability group is we need to have had at least one full backup before we can create an availability group. So I've added that here into the code as well. Very simple, backup database to disk, dropping it in the default backups folder, which is under uh, MS SQL backup, and then giving it the backup here, name of our backup file. So it's simple as that. There's not a lot to this. Um, I'm not gonna run this because obviously I've already done that. Um, if I did, it would still run because I am dropping them if they already exist. The backup's will overwrite, so it's not a big deal. I could run this over and over again. So I'll give you that code in the blog post so you'll have access to be able to do that. Now, the SQL Server has been installed everywhere. I've installed a local instance on every one of the nodes. The other thing we need to do, and I've done this already just to make sure, because I don't want to have to reboot here, but I'll give you the code for this, is we need to enable the always on feature. So I'll give you this. This PowerShell code here will allow you to go through and turn always on on every one of these nodes. You can do that manually. You can actually do that through Configuration Manager. So if I open up Config Manager here. I'll just show you where that is. So you can do this manually if you want to. You'll be looking for the SQL Server service. We're going to go into Properties here, the Always on High Availability tab. And then what you're looking for is to check off this box here, Enable Always on Availability Groups. So I've already done that. When you do that, it does have to restart the instance. All that's actually in the PowerShell code, so it's pretty easy to run. You just kick it off. It'll check off that box. It'll restart the SQL Server service. It'll also make sure the agent is restarted as well. So all that's built into the code, so you can do that fairly easily. But just to make life a little bit quicker, I've actually already run that before this video. So no secrets there. Give you all the code for that in the post. 
So you guys can go use that and use that as you need to. So now we're down to just creating the availability group. So this is the fun part. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk you through the code. I'll give you all this T-SQL code so you can do this yourself. You could do this through the GUI, except for the fact that we have intentionally dedicated our network traffic that's going to do the log block shipping for our availability groups to its own network. You cannot do that through the GUI. That has to be done through T-SQL. You could go through the GUI and then go back and change the IP on the endpoint. I do have blog posts. I will link to that in here so that you can see those as well. So you could do the whole thing to the GUI and go back and just change the IP address for the endpoint ports. To me, it's just easier to do it through T-SQL. Plus, this is repeatable. You're building a lab environment, so you want to be able to break this down and recreate this uh, multiple times. So it's much better to have this in the code anyway, and I'm giving it to you. So I've gone using SQL command mode here, and the first thing I'm going to do is take care of logins. It's pretty straightforward and pretty simple. I'm going to connect to node 1. I'm going to create a login for the account that's running the SQL Server service on instance 2 and instance 3. Right? So they're all local instances on each node. Node 1 is using svc-sql1, node 2 is using svc-sql2, and 3 is using svc-sql3 as the account running the SQL Server service is how I've chosen to do this. There are other ways to do this. You could use the same account, manage service accounts, that kind of stuff. But for this, we're just going to do that. So node 1 needs to have 2 and 3 added. Node 2 would need 1 and 3, and 3 would need 1 and 2. So that's what we're doing. We're connecting to node 1, creating the logins for the other two instances, connecting to node 2, creating the logins for those two other two instances, connecting to node 3, creating the login for those instances. So I'll go ahead and run that. Comes back, everything's good. So we get those created. Next step here is to create those endpoints. So I'm going to connect to each node and create an endpoint on that particular node. I'm going to do create endpoint. I'm going to give that endpoint a name. I'm going to tell it that the state is started and then it's ready to go. I am using the default listener port here of 5022, but here's the important piece right here. We are defining a listener IP address. So if you remember, we have an IP that we have given a NIT card that's dedicated to AG traffic. On node 1, that IP is 10.0.1.1. You can always go back to the very first blog post in this series where I've put all the IP addresses that you're going to need. So if you wanted to go figure that out and verify what that was, that is very easy to do. Here's the network 3 for the AG. So if I'm on node 1, here's my 10.0.1.1. So we'll do that. Um, everything else here is pretty standard. Database mirroring is all. We're using Negotiate. Uh, we're using AES as our encryption algorithm. And then once you create the endpoint here on, on node 1, we need to give the account for node 2 and node 3 access to be able to connect to that endpoint. So we're saying grant connect on the endpoint using the name of the endpoint we created up here and granting it those permissions. So I'm going to do that here on node 1. We're going to do it again on node 2. Only difference here on node 2 is we're using a different IP. Node 2 is 10.0.1.2 is the IP that we've assigned that one to use for our AG. So everything else is the same, granting connect to the accounts of the other two instances. In this case, it would be 1 and 3. We'll go into node 3. Same deal here. Different IP. Remember, this guy is in a completely different data center, completely different subnet, 172.18.0.3. That's what we're using for that guy. So we can connect here as well. Go ahead and create that endpoint. And so that creates that communication channel between all three nodes so they can all talk to each other. This is what we do log block shipping on for availability groups. That's the pipe. That's the network. So now we've dedicated our traffic. And great, that's exactly what we wanted. That's how we set up this cluster, right? We've got a public network. We've got a private network just for the heartbeat is alive, looks alive, SB server underscore diagnostics, all that kind of stuff's running on that channel. And then, of course, we've got our availability group shipping those log blocks on this particular network. The last thing we want to do, or not the last thing, but the next thing we want to do here is we want to enable the extended event sessions for Always On Health. They already exist. Uh, they come like that out of the box, even if you haven't turned availability groups on. They're just not turned on, but the event is there. 
So all we really need to do is go in and turn it on, which we're doing here. And then we're going to make sure that it's the server state is starts. That way it will continue to always be on every time I start. Repeating the code here, right? I do that on node one, gonna do it here again on node two, gonna do the exact same code here on node three. So nothing super special there. We're just turning that extended event session on on all three nodes. Here's where the fun starts. We're gonna connect to node one, which I'm on node one, by the way. I'm going to turn trace flag 9567 on. These databases that I created are completely empty. I don't really need to do that, but this enables compression. So I'm going to use seeding. Seeding is something that came out in SQL 2016 that allows me to not have to do the backup and restore and seed it over. These databases are completely empty, so very easy in my lab test environment to be able to do this. So I'll turn that on to enable compression. Then I'm going to go in and create the availability group here. I'm going to call it App1 AG. I'm giving it some, some preferences here. I'm setting my automated backup preference, default failure condition level, health check timeout is the default value. I am turning database failover on. I am turning DTC per DB support on. And I'm using a cluster type of WSFC, Windows Server Failover Cluster. I'm creating it for all three of those databases I created. I have one AG, DB1, DB2, and DB3. Adding all those to my AG. And then I'm defining what my replicas are. First replica is node one. And you'll notice that the endpoint, right, one line, node one, node two, node three, giving them all endpoint URLs. I am using fully qualified domain names here. I suggest that you always do that as well. And I am using the default 5022 port. You can use whatever port you want here. I do suggest that whatever port you use, if you decide to alter it, use the same port on every replica. So I'm choosing to do the failover mode to be automatic on node one and node two, but to be manual on node three. I'm actually using synchronous commit mode on all three of them here. And then I'm setting backup priority and what I want them to be in the secondary role. And then last session timeout. And the last thing of course, is I'm turning the seating mode to automatic. That way I don't have to do the backup restore. It'll ship all that over for me. As part of that creation, I'm also creating the listener here. This is important. This is why those permissions needed to be in place or it wouldn't have worked. Alter availability group app one AG. Add the listener, which is going to be app one AG with these IPs. Again, I have these IPs in the very first blog post where all that stuff is documented out in that spreadsheet and that, that uh, table I've got there on the, on the page. We're using 10.0.0.11, which is in our public network in the first data center and 172.16.0.11, which is the public side of the second data center. That way I have IPs that are valid in both ranges. So let's run this section. This will create the AG, it'll create our listener for us. And then once we do that, we can actually even take a peek at it over here on the left. I'll refresh, we'll look at availability groups. You see there's nothing here now. We can refresh this and kind of get an idea of what's going on. So that finished, let me refresh here on the left. Now we should see our AG here. There's my listener. There's the databases that I have. So everything's looking good, except of course, I've got some red X's here and that's by design because we haven't added the databases here yet. So that's what we need to do next in order to resolve that. I can also refresh my databases here. Say that they all say they're synchronized. If I were to look at my other two nodes, here's node two, no databases, let's refresh. Still not there. Refresh here, still not here. Why? Because we haven't joined them yet, right? So let's do that now. Connect to node two, alter the availability group, and join it. We're also going to grant create any database. This is required for seeding. You have to grant this permission in order for seeding to be able to create the database and then ship the log blocks over. We'll run that on node two and node three, exact same code on both of them so that they will both join. We can also take a look at this. I've got uh, some commented code out here for you, uh, an extended event session you could create if you wanted to keep an eye on the status of the seating, or you could also just look at this HADR physical seating stats DMV. If we take a look at it here, we can see already that uh, I've got success across the board here already. So it's already done. Of course, these databases are empty, so that's expected. 
So if I refresh now, here's my databases in a synchronized state. Refresh node 3, I get them in a synchronized state. And of course, if I refresh my replicas up here, now they're no longer red. Now they're actually synchronizing. So that's looking good. We're actually done creating the AG at this point. Uh, we are going to turn our trace flag off here at the very end just to turn that compression back off. That creates the AG. We're done at this point. It did create some things in the background, by the way. I told you it would create some, a computer object over here in uh, Active Directory. If I refresh, sure enough, here's my app one AG. So that represents that. We're also going to see that in DNS. So if you want to go look in DNS, you can absolutely do that and check out what it creates in DNS there as well. We can look at the cluster. We definitely want to look in here, right? So here's the roles. Here is my app one AG role. And I can see that I have my resources in here. If I zoom in, this is the availability group itself. We're good here. This is my network name and then my two IP addresses for both public networks. This, remember, is by design, just like it was in the cluster that we talked about in the last module. 172.16.11 is only valid if I'm on node 3. So if I were to fail the availability group over, which we can certainly do, we'll come in here and we'll just use the GUI real quick. Fail it over to node 3. Connect to node 3. Do the fail over here. Should be pretty quick. Then we can come back and we should see these IPs reverse. In fact, they've already done it. All right, if I zoom in and I take a look here, now the 10001 is offline, right? We can see that he's red and offline here. But I also see that the IP that is being used right now is the 17216, which is valid for node 3. The 10011 is valid on node 1 or node 2 because they're both in that network on the public side in my first data center. So this is what a traditional multi-subnet availability group would look like. This is what we would expect to see inside the cluster and inside SQL Server. So everything is good here. So that completes the availability group section. So the next section we're going to take a look at is what if I wanted to build a failover cluster instance on top of here? How exactly would I do that? And we're only going to do that across the first two nodes. We're not even going to include all three. It's just for us to kind of play with and have an example. If you want to add it to all three, you can certainly do that. Uh, but I'm just going to show you how we would handle things like shared storage and that stuff uh, inside of your lab environment. So uh, I hope you enjoy this, and I will catch you on the next one.